we play Maybe one day we will see We're one big family Like it's one at all Okay, that is the migration theory. It was developed around the 1700s, and it hasn't changed much since the 1700s. Some information has changed, but they have not changed this theory, okay? Now, again, people came across Beringia, across this, they said that they came down the ice-free corridor before the ice caps melted, and it was the last ice age, and they ended up in this area right here, which is around New Mexico. And uh, there's one place called Folsom where they found some bones and another place called Clovis where they really found tools. Clovis was the first place where they found and they found uh, tools there and they named the tools Clovis Tools. And so then they named what they call the first Americans Clovis people. And that is because of them finding these little artifacts in this area right here, okay? Now, the name of the place today is called Clovis. It wasn't Clovis back then, but, you know, that's what they do, okay? Now, the thing is this, is that now, here are some Clovis points. These are some of the tools that the Native Americans made so that they could dig and do whatever it is that they're going to do. You know, they used it to clean animals, the skin, and, you know, they, they did all sorts of things with those tools. Problem is this, is that in the United States, they have found pre-Clovis tools, okay? So now you have tools here that are older than Clovis, which now means you have a people who were here before Clovis people. All right, now, if that is the case, why haven't they changed that migration theory yet? They haven't changed it. Who knows when they will? And, 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 and they're, they're still trying to figure it out, I think. <laughs> they're trying to explain. They're trying to figure out how they can explain a few things. Because I'm about to show you some things that they have to do some explaining to. Okay. She was, yes. Yeah, so she was not even a modern human. Okay. So again, that's just showing. Humans have not been here that long. So they were not here when the continents were together. You know, so see, and that's another thing that people like to tell. Oh, but well, when the continents divided that we were on. No, we weren't. I'm sorry, we weren't. You know, now, I'm not saying that, that those predecessors, even the predecessors before humans, uh, I'm not even going to say that none of them made that, that they did not make it here to the Americas. Uh, who's to say that, that, you know, I still say that there's probably some that did. You know, and I do believe that they have found some, some bones over, over in uh, California that are older than the human bones, I think. You know, but still, that's still, you know, research that they're still working on. You know, they're still, yeah. And again, that's what this is. This is a work in progress, and that's what they really need to let people know. It's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. Okay, so now again, we have these pre-Clovis points. So again, that means that people were here and they were creating before Clovis people arrived. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over some, uh, a couple of these places. Most of these places are going to be on your eastern coast. This place is the only place that is on the western side of, of uh, the Americas, but you see it is all the way down at the southern tip of South America. If you recall the migration map, it said that they, land, that they got there about 10 to 11,000 years ago. Okay? That's what they said. However, this site, Monteverde, this is all, and it's really only about 400 miles away from the coast here. So again, people had the capabilities of traveling, so they also had the capabilities of traveling across land and water. So they could very easily, maybe if they landed from the um, uh, Atlantic, to travel across the uh, water. You know, I, I don't see, I don't think that that's that far-fetched. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that that's that far-fetched. But anyway, <laughs> this site was founded in, in, uh, in the early 1970s. And they did some radiocarbon dating of some of these things. And they radiocarbon dated and found that these things are dated to be 14,000 years ago. Now remember the migration map said 10 to 11,000 years ago. How could these people have gotten all the way down to the southern tip of South America, crossing the Bering Strait across ice, all the way down there 14,000 years ago? Okay, there's something amiss here. <laughs> something is amiss. Now, when they did the radiocarbon dating, the archaeologists and the scientists and everybody, they just dismissed the information. They said, oh, no, it doesn't agree with the Clovis theory, and so we will just dismiss it. And they dismissed it for over 30 years. It wasn't until 1997 when they went back to readdress the information that they read, you know, redid the testing, re-radiocarbon dated the things, and found out that, guess what, 
They were 14,000 years old. So now they, now the archaeologists and everybody is in agreement that the things are 14,000 years old. But that's all. They're not rewriting anything, okay? <laughs> At least not yet. They're not because they haven't figured it out yet, okay? <laughs> okay, but this is just Monteverdi. These other sites that you're going to see is just a few more that I'm going to be showing you. But they're all on the east coast of the United States, all right? Not, not coming across the Bering Strait, okay? This place is in Pennsylvania. It is called the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. It was excavated in 1973. And it was uh, excavated again in 1978. And there they found out that they have radiocarbon dated things to be 19,000 years ago, OK? Which is what, over 8,000 years here before those Clovis people made it? 8,000, that's a long time. 8,000, <laughs> that's a long time, OK? All right, but this is uh, in Pennsylvania. There's other places also. I'm, oh, let me just go back and show you. You see they have other little, little things there, okay, which I'm sure are other little areas where they have found stuff. Look at this one, Marsh Creek, okay. <laughs> Very close to Philadelphia, okay. All right, yeah, need to check that out, right. Okay, now, this place is in Virginia. It's called Cactus Hill. This place was found by uh, artifact collectors, people that were just going around digging, looking for stuff. And so they found this in the 1980s. Uh, however, again, they, uh, they, they didn't radiocarbon date things, though, until the 1990s. And when they, carbon, when they radiocarbon dated things, they found out that they had artifacts there that were dating 14, 18, 18 to 20,000 years ago. 18 to 20,000. And again, now remember, and these are all, now again, you see the, uh, these, more, these tools here are more archaic than you see you have Clovis tools here also. You know, so you have this culture that lived here during that time, but then you also have an older culture that was also living there, okay? And again, these are your older tools that they found, all right? 18 to 20,000 years ago. This to me is the most interesting site. <coughs> this is in South Carolina, in Allendale, South Carolina. They call it the Topper Archaeological Site. Uh, this site, um, I'm not sure when it was found but I do know that the gentleman that is the head of the research there, uh, started, he started there in the 1980s. So again, I don't know how long the site has, when they found it or anything. It's in Allendale, Allendale County, okay? And Allendale County, as you can see, is just right here, right along the lines of uh, South Carolina and Georgia, okay? <laughs> what, is, what is very interesting, what is very interesting about Allendale County, guess what, is that it is, <laughs> It's like 90 some percent black, even today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, yeah, my family's from, um, my, my mom is from South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, and this, this site here, again, and the reason why I find it interesting is well, I'm, I'm going to read one statement and then I'm going to tell you another statement about this site. But this is the man who was working there. He says, based on radiocarbon dates of the charcoal, the sediment that was found at the site that I think we have evidence of human activity here in the interior of America 40 to 50,000 years ago. So they have found evidence there. Now again, they didn't find bones there, but they found human activity there. They found charcoal, they found burnt items that were there where people were probably cooking something, okay? So, and again, this sediment is dated 40 to 50,000 years ago. He goes on to say that he believes that this area was an area where people came now. They believed that they were making tools. From, they would come there to this area to make their tools. They got church from this area. So he believes that they were coming to this area, getting their tools, and then going back to where they, you know, to where they lived and, you know, and, and lived there. So this was just an area where they would come to, uh, to get tools. Okay? But he says that he believes that that people were coming to this area here or into the Americas not long after humans were leaving out of Africa. This is what this man says, who is the, he's the professor uh, that is leading this archaeological site here in South Carolina. So that, so it's a monkey wrench in the theory that everybody came out of Africa. Uh-oh, most, most definitely. Or, what it does, or what it does show is that maybe if they came out of Africa that long ago, 
that again, that, that once they, if they reach this area, come on, 50,000 years, how long does, it, I mean, how long do you need to be in a place before you're called indigenous to that place? Okay, like for example, you know, like when the Asians finally reached Asia, they're called Asians. They're not called African Asians. Okay, when, the, when they reached Australia, the people there in Australia, they're called Australians. They're not, so the darker people aren't called African Australians. You know, they're Australians. And like you say, so, you know, we're Americans and the people, the indigenous people here, they're Americans, whether, what, what, no matter what color you are, because again, there's no such thing as the race and the colors and all this, there's no such thing. You know, but again, it was created to cause division. And that division has worked very well, <laughs> very well. And it's still working very well. Like I said, even within now, you know, within the, even the conscious community now, it is so now divided because if I say that I'm a Native American, then that person over there is saying, oh, well, what are you doing? You denying your blackness? Why aren't you black? And why, you know, oh, the mother, mother Africa, what happened to Mother Africa? Well, you know what, guess what? The earth is the mother. Right. Africa is not the mother. Right. The earth is the mother. So that is where our emotional attachment should be, to the earth. Not to any, any you know, and again, if it was all one landmass in the beginning anyway, and, and guess what, and that wasn't the first time that, the, that, 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 the, that they divided up. Okay, because, uh, and it definitely wasn't called Africa. <laughs> it definitely wasn't called Africa. You know, so again, so see, the, that's the emotional things that, you know, when we're learning history that we really have to stay, you know, pay attention to the facts and not get too emotional about it. Because again, you know, I get that all the time. Oh, oh, you're just denying your blackness. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. So again, and when we think about these people, and again, remember I told you that they had the capabilities of traveling on water, all right? So it, why wouldn't it be difficult then for them then to get on this water, get on the current and get over here. Like I said, like Ivan Van Sertima said, is that these things are like, they're, 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 they're like conveyor belts. Yeah. Hey, come right here real quick. And see, and again, they knew the land. They knew the land, so when Columbus ended up over there, they knew how to get out of there. That's why the, that's why the lands were being, being cleared. They, didn't have the, they were losing the people because the people were leaving. Not that they were dying from diseases, they were leaving. They were getting the heck out of there. You know, wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't you? I would. Okay, and, that's, and see, those are things also that we had to, we had to put common sense into when we're learning things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we had to put common sense into things. Uh, okay. <laughs> I try to read, every, you know, I try to read a lot of different things. All right, and again, this is just another article that I, that, that I ran across. And this one was written by National Geographic. So again, I tried to show you where, you know, that I'm not just getting things out of the air, okay? And this was uh, written in 2008. And again, 2008, it is now 2016. Have they changed any information? No, and this is National Geographic. You know they have this information, okay? You know that the, the powers that be have this information, okay? But anyway, this is talking about a female skeleton that was dated 13,500 years ago. This was found in the Yucatan Peninsula, okay? So now again, 13,600 years is, is what, 1,600 years of, uh, yeah, after when they were supposed to have arrived or come below those, uh, the ice caps, 12,000, okay? So this is way before 12,000, where they're finding these uh, skeletons in the Yucatan. It was found underwater, and again, when the ice caps melted, it caused the shorelines to come, uh, to, to recede, or, uh, okay, and that's why some things ended up underwater. Yeah, yeah, the water, yeah, the water came in, so things went underwater. You know, and so that's why even if you go into the Caribbean, you will find some things underwater there because the shorelines were much further out, okay? And anyway, this says, we don't know how the people whose remains were found in the caves arrived and uh, whether they came from the Atlantic, the jungle, or inside the continent. Okay, now again, you know, we have to think about what this article is saying. What are they saying? From the Atlantic? They came from the Atlantic? What are they saying here? Okay. But we believe these finds are the oldest yet to be found in the Americas and may influence our theories of how the first people arrived. Oh, so we may change. Yeah, we may change it, okay? 
we may change it. In addition to possibly altering the timeline of human settlement in the Americas, the remains may cause experts to rethink where the first Americans came from. Oh, so now, yeah, so where they came from, they're going to rethink. Now, why is that? Let's go on. Says clues from the skeleton skulls, the skeleton skulls hint that the people may not be of northern Asian descent, which would contradict the dominant theory of New World settlement. Okay, remember they said, uh, you know, from northern Asia across the Bering Strait and then on down. Okay, the shape of the skulls has led us to believe that Eva and the others have more of an affinity with people from South Asia than North Asia. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, so now, and now again, this is where I'm saying where when you're reading things, you have to pay attention. Most people will just read that and keep on going to the next paragraph and not thinking about that. It's like, well, wait a minute. What's the difference between Northern Asia and Southern, Southern Asia? Let's take a peek and see, okay? These are your Northern Asian countries, okay? Siberia, Mongolia, Kakistan, Moscow, all right, and I don't think, but I'll show it to you anyway. You know what those people look like, okay? They're Asians, all right? And that's what our Asian population looks like, okay? Now, this is our map of uh, Southern Asia, okay? You see you have Thailand, you have India, you have Malaysia, we have Indonesia here, there's Borneo, uh, Australia's down here, but we have uh, New Guinea and Malaysia, they're, they're over here on this side here. Okay, and these are your Southern Asian countries. Okay, now. You know, it's funny because, you know, being musicians, you know, we, we traveled a lot in Asia and we got a lot of friends that are still traveling there. Mm -hmm. And they're in mostly, you know, our music is widely accepted in South Asia. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, if we don't pay attention to what we're reading, we will not even think about this fact right here. And then we now have to think about why didn't they say in the article? Why didn't they just say that these people have more of an affinity to, uh, to the Negroids as opposed to the Asians? You know, why didn't they say that? Because again, they would be giving us too much information. Because now we're going to find a little bit more about our culture and our history that's going to make us go back and read a little bit more. And they, yeah, they don't want us to do that. Remember a long time ago, I know when I was growing up, they like, oh, okay, look, don't, look, black people, they, we do not want them to learn how to read, okay? Now, it's taken, what is it, about 200 years for us to even get to this point. Learn that, we learned how to read, <laughs> okay? But now, hey, guess what, now it's the time, all right? Okay, so now, see, these are things that we need to think about as we're reading, okay? And so, it, right, okay? So now, what can we infer about what we just learned? And again, I say infer because, I, like I, you know, I said before, I, I was a teacher, and reading was one subject that I did have to teach. And so when I was teaching that, we always told our people, look, you have to infer. You have to use your brains. You, you know, when you're reading, you just can't read. You have to use your brain. You have to think about what you've read. You have to summarize in your brain what you've read. You have to use context clues. And you have to make inferences, okay, because everything is not there in black and white. Okay, so now, what can we infer? One thing that we can infer is that the Americas were probably populated by more than one migration. Okay, everyone did not come over here across the Bering Strait. Okay, everybody didn't come across that. Okay, we can infer that there was an earlier migration before Clovis. All right, how do we know that? The pre Clovis points. All right, so again, we, we can infer that. So as some, most of the Africans were, or, and again, I don't like to use that terminology, Africans, because they weren't Africans, okay? They were humans, all right? So now, when most of your humans were heading to the left, I mean to the right, I don't know my left or my right, y'all. Uh, <laughs> some humans decided, look, we're going to go against the curve. We're going to go this way. Y'all can go that way. I'm going to go this way. I'm going to see what, I want to see what's over here, you know? And, and, and that's not out of the question. We know black people do that all the time. It's like, I ain't going with y'all. <laughs> that Negroid people, along with Mongoloid people, populated archaic America, 
Okay, so there were Negroid people, there were dark-skinned people that were here in the Americas. All right, now, there were, again, there were other migrations. So these two migrations were not the only migrations. There were several other migrations. There was a white migration, okay? And we know even as, 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 as late as the Vikings, but we do know that they made it over here, okay? And there were, vi there were migrations before that. So now, you had the white people that were coming around, you had the Asians that were coming, you had the black people that were coming, and what do they do? They do what humans do, they intermingle. And you get all different colors of people just like the black population today. It's no different. There's no different. These are some of the artifacts that have been found in here in the United States. Okay? They were all found in mounds. And that is because the culture of people that they said were here in the United States, they labeled them mound builders. Okay? All of these were found in mounds here. I picked these because they have Negroid features. But I will tell you this, not all artifacts have Negroid features. I chose these because I'm revealing our dark skin past, okay? Now, you'll be able to research and you'll see other things, okay? Uh, but again, I just want to let you, you know, because uh, again, I want to be forward with you. This isn't the only thing that you're going to find, okay? So again, the mound builders were a general terminology referring to the indigenous inhabitants of North America who constructed various styles of earthen mounds for burial, residential, and ceremonial purposes. Okay? We have our conical mound, a mound that's in the shape of a cone. Okay? I do believe that this mound is in Virginia. I do believe that that mound is in Virginia. This is an earthen mound, which is basically a conical mound, but you see it is, it is hollow on the inside. This mound is in, right outside of Macon, Georgia. It's at a uh, complex which was called the Akmogi uh, Complex, Native American Complex. I have been inside this mound. Um, it is a, uh, inside they have little area where the, uh, the, the chiefs would sit around and where they would have their little power, where their meetings, you know, they sit around there. There was a place for a pit in the center. So of course, if there was a pit, they had to have somewhere for the uh, smoking things. To, you know, so up there on the top, they had to make sure that there was um, ways for the smoking things to vent out. You know, so I mean, these people were creating things with, with very scientific minds. Because again, if, uh, this thing's created um, a thousand years ago, how is it still standing? You know, they had to know physics and science to be able to create these things. Okay, now uh, this is a, a temple or a flat top mound. Uh, that one is in Etowah, yes, yes. Okay, I haven't been to Etowah. I went to the Akmogi, which is down at Macon, but I haven't been to the Etowah, but I'm going to get to Etowah. I want to get there, because I want to I wanna get on top of that mound right there. <laughs> oh, I felt it on top of the one that's in, because uh, they have a flat top mound in Akmogi also. Oh yeah, you definitely feel it. It's, it I mean, it's, 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 it's a pole, you know, it really, it really is. And then we have a, uh, the effigy mound, okay, which they, uh, they visited there uh, last, yeah. last week. Okay, this is a mound that, that is called the, uh, uh, serpent thank you, the serpent mound. We, we've come to a conclusion where we don't believe that it's a serpent mound. I think it's a sperm cell. Okay. If you look at it, if you pan out, there are other pictures that show this mound, you know, in more of an artist rendition of it, and, you know, and there's some overhead shots from actual, Shots. Well, I can tell, I can see what you're saying by the front of this right here. You know, and, and again, they just named it, named it what they wanted to name it. Okay, because again, we're going we're gonna to run into a mound that, you know, but they called it Monk's Mound, but they named it Monk's Mound because the monks in the 1400s, no, in the 1500s, they found monks there. There weren't any Native American monks. How are you going to name a mound a Monk's Mound? Okay. Okay, so now let's go over some of these mound sites, okay? This one is the Watson Break Mound, which is the oldest mound site that is here in the United States, okay? This mound site is, uh, has 11 mounds that are from 3 feet to 25 feet, okay? And this is what, that is a real image of what those mounds look like today, okay? And this oval that they're in, well, notice that there's also a little platform that the mounds are on. And the oval is 153 feet wide, okay, which is pretty wide. Now again, I was trying, I didn't know, I'm like, okay, you know what, I want to know how wide 50, 853 feet is, okay? So, guess what? Those, they don't know really what it is. They did not 
live at that site. So it wasn't a site where they lived. And I do believe that they just went there. They may have been burial mounds. Uh, and we do believe that they went there and, and they visited there. They had ceremonies there. Yeah, but they, they did not live at that site. Yeah, they did not live at that site. Okay, but again, this building is exactly 853 feet tall. It is the tallest building in San Francisco. All right, you can see how it is towering over these buildings here and even towering over the skyscrapers that are in San Francisco. This is the transatlantic pyramid that they call this, okay? And it is 853 feet high. So again, that's how big that mound site is. Okay, now, and this mound site is dated to 3400 BCE. So before the Christian era, 3400 years before the Christian era. Okay, so that means that, that the, those, those mounds are almost 6,000 years old. So this is, this is pre-Diluvial? Pre-who? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of those dates. So, uh, so I'll just say, you know, again, 3400 BCE, so I'm not sure of, of, of other dates. You know, I just know. Where is this location? This is in Louisiana, northern Louisiana. These mounds here are those mounds there. Oh, okay, right, okay. Okay, that is the image. That's what they look like today in northern Louisiana, okay? And then again, that is the oldest mound site, 3400 BCE, okay? This is the oldest mound complex. People lived at this site. This is also in northern Louisiana. This is called Poverty Point, okay? Poverty Point was dated between 2000 and 1000 BCE. Okay, so again, before the Christian era. Oh, I will let you know that, that uh, the, other, um, the other mound site, Watson Break, that was built before the pyramids. Okay, that was built before the pyramids, so I will tell you that. That was built before the pyramids. And these were built, probably built around the times of the pyramids. Okay, and they have like five mounds, I do believe. So this will be a mound here, here, here. And okay, no, that's six, all right? Those are mounds. But also notice these little ridges here. They said that these ridges were, uh, at the time when the people were living there, they said about uh, 2,000, 4,000 people. Um, uh, 4, 4,000 to 6,000 people lived there, okay? And they said that, that, that those things were about five feet high, and they do believe that it was that high because this is water right here. Most of your Native American uh, villages and cities and things were put beside water because they utilized the water for everything, you know? They, they used it to, uh, you know, to, to provide irrigation and, you know, all those things. Okay, so, again, five feet high, and they do believe that, they, that, that then residences were put on top of those. They, and that's what they believe is how the people lived there, all right? This mound here, which is called, they call this an effigy mound. And they're saying this is an effigy mound. They're saying this is in the shape of a bird, all right? So they call it bird mound, all right? Bird mound is, um, it is the second tallest mound here in the United States. This is a side view of what bird mound looks like today. Okay, and some of these mounds, if you go to them today, they're, they're going to be covered by trees. You know, some, you probably wouldn't even recognize most of them, you know. Okay, but anyway, uh, this, this mound is the second largest mound, and if we measure the size of that mound, it is the size of a professional baseball field. Okay, so again, these things, they're humongous structures that were made out of dirt that is still standing. <laughs> still standing. Yes? 